Hello and welcome to another lecture in natural science. Um, I didn't get a lot of feedback about the format, so I'm going to move back to the board here and just talk to you as I would a class. It's a lot easier for me to uh, kind of write things down here rather than use PowerPoint, make nice pretty pictures and slides and text and stuff. This is lecture O and we're talking about uh, gravity and motion. Today we're going to focus on motion. Now we've mentioned the scientist Galileo from time to time, a famous scientist lived many years ago, um, and he developed what is called a thought experiment. And he imagined if someone was in a boat and uh, there was no windows anywhere, okay, so they couldn't see anything outside about an island or a person on the shoreline or something, and also imagined that the boat was moving but the surface of the ocean is perfectly uh, calm, okay? So, of course, it's a thought experiment. We know there's waves and stuff and wind and everything else, okay? But imagine you're in a boat, the windows are all closed, and you're moving along, okay, at the surface of the ocean, traveling from town A to town B, okay? And how would you know if you're moving slowly or moving quickly? You wouldn't know because you can't see out the window, right? You need to look at a tree, for example, and see if it's moving you know, slowly or if it's moving fast, right? That's how you know if you're moving, okay? So motion is always relative, okay? You yourself have to observe something over there that's not moving, and based on its change in position or angle and whatnot, that's how you know if you're moving quickly or not. He also extended the analogy to think about an island, so pretend like there's a, uh, you know, tropical island, a palm tree with some coconuts maybe, and there's a person over here, okay, looking, and, and this time we'll pretend like there are windows on the ship and waves and everything else, okay, and there's a ship here, okay, and uh, there's a, a pilot on the ship, okay, and it's passing the island now, when you look at a person, the person, if, if you don't think about you moving, the person appears to be moving, let's say, to the left, all right? But if you're the person looking at the ship, the ship appears to be moving uh, to the right, okay? The opposite way. So a ship will look at the island, and we could say that the island is moving, okay, based on your observation. Or if you are on the island, you can look at the ship and notice that the ship is moving. Okay. Of course, we know islands don't move, but motion, once again, is always relative, relative to something that is standing still. Okay. If you're on a bicycle, been a while since I've drawn little figures of bicycles, but let's say you're on a bicycle and uh, you're going along for a couple hours. You're dry, riding your bike and everything, and uh, you're looking at some cloud formations, and as you're riding your bicycle, you notice that the clouds are moving, you know, over time to the left, okay? Now, does that mean that you're moving to the right? Does it mean that you're moving fast? Does it mean you're moving slow? Well, it's not a good gauge to use clouds as a reference because clouds are moving also, okay? You need to um, gauge your motion or your speed and velocity, which we'll talk about in, in a bit, based on a reference point that is not moving, okay? So if there's a light pole or um, you know a telephone pole with some wires or something, and you're looking at the telephone pole, which is not moving, and you're riding by the uh, telephone pole quickly, right? The telephone pole is going to move past your uh, vantage point very quickly. But a cloud might not be moving past your vantage point because the cloud is traveling with you, right? Or the cloud could be uh, blown in the opposite direction and appear to be moving very quickly. It doesn't mean you're moving fast, okay? So clouds are not a good reference. This is what we call a stationary reference. It does not move, okay? 
and uh, this is the object that's moving, okay? Now, to measure motion, you need to measure two things. You need to measure uh, position or distance, and you need to measure time. We've just had the Olympics here, and so in, when somebody runs a race, for example, there are two points that define the distance. There's the starting point or the starting line that the runners begin on, and then there's the finish line, the line that they end on, right? So that's a distance defined by, you know, those two points, right? The distance is always the length between two points, and we measure that in meters, for example, in the metric system, in the United States, we might measure that in miles. And then time, you have two different uh, time points that you use, right? If we have a stopwatch, it's reading zero, and right when um, they start the race, you know, if they fire the gun in the air or whatever, you know, in the old, di old days, and you would start the stopwatch, and it would tick, 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 tick. And then when the first racer gets past the finish line, you would stop the stopwatch, and then you would look to see how much time has elapsed. Maybe it was 32.5 seconds or something, and maybe the distance is, you know, 200 meters or something like that, okay? And, uh, so speed is um, a, um, a measure of motion, and speed is measured as distance divided by time, okay? Now we're going to consider constant speed. So pretend like somebody's driving on a perfectly flat road and they're driving 55 miles per hour with the cruise control and there are no hills or anything or uh, braking or speeding up or traffic that would make them speed up or slow down, okay? So if we started the measurement here, so we'll drive a car here, all right? And uh, we're, we're driving it in this direction here, okay? And if this car is driving 55 miles per hour, it means that one hour is going to travel a distance of 55 miles, okay? After an additional hour, okay, it's going to drive twice that, okay? 110 miles, okay? And you can use your uh, calculator if, uh, you're having trouble with the, the next uh, part here, okay? So three hours, okay, we multiply 55 by three and you get 165 miles, okay? And so if you take the distance and you divide by the time, you're going to get the speed of the car, which is 55 miles. It's easiest to do it here, 55 miles divided by one hour is 55 miles per hour, right? Oh, by the way, H stands for hour. I'm sorry to throw that in there. So this is miles per hour or miles over hour. So that's 55 miles per hour. And we're familiar with that abbreviation. That's what MPH stands for and that's the speed. We could also do the same math here. If we knew that the car traveled a distance of 110 miles in two hours, the speed of the car is going to be, we use this formula, distance divided by time, so it's 110 miles in two hours, okay? And the way you punch this into your calculator is you type 110, and then you hit the divide button here on your calculator, okay? And you type two, and then you hit the equal or the answer key on your calculator, and you get 55 miles per hour, okay? So we're again pretending that this car is traveling at a constant speed, and so every hour it's gonna tick off an additional 55 miles that it, it, it journeys. 
So speed is distance divided by time. You need to know two things. You need to be able to uh, measure distance and you need to be able to measure time. Now a person in a windowless uh, ship, assu assuming they had a flashlight or something, could measure time. They could click the stopwatch and then after one hour click the stopwatch, but they wouldn't be able to measure any distance or gauge how far they have traveled um, without knowing any other information, okay? So that's uh, speed. Now, what is velocity? Okay, so we have some key words here, motion, speed. And the next key word is velocity. Velocity is the direction of your speed, okay? So it contains two components. It, compo it contains speed, the quantity of of uh, motion divided by time we've, we've been talking about, and direction, okay? So it's called a vector in mathematics. A vector has direction and magnitude. If I say a baseball was thrown at 40 miles per hour, you might be assuming, okay, well, it's, it's a pitch. It's being thrown towards, um, you know, the batter or something. 40 miles per hour is pretty slow nowadays for a pitch in Major League base Baseball. It could be a pitch to first base. I mean, it could be a throw to first base, or it could be a, a throw from the outfield to the infield. I mean, you know, we don't have the direction. We just have the speed, okay? So we indicate this with arrows, okay? If the wind is blowing, five miles per hour to the north, we indicate that with an arrow. The arrow is pointing directly up. We're assuming that's north on this map or this imaginary uh, surface. And the length of that arrow is the speed, okay? If the wind is blowing eight miles per hour to the south, we can indicate that with an arrow pointing down, but eight is a larger number than five, so we would indicate that with a larger arrow pointing to the south, okay? So when you're talking about velocity, it's very important to uh, note in which direction it is going, either with a vocabulary word like north or graphically with an arrow pointing a certain direction, okay? So it has a direction, that's the way the arrow points, and it has a magnitude, which is the length of the arrow. The magnitude represents the speed, all right? So five miles per hour is the speed, and north is the direction, okay? So we have many different ways of uh, indicating that, okay? If you're analyzing a, uh, an accident at an intersection, you would wanna know if the two cars had collided head on, or if the cars had collided at, a, at an angle, or a glancing angle or something like that in order to kind of analyze the skid marks and how did the car end up, you know, over here, crash into that business and whose, whose fault was it and everything. You can get tape measures and you can measure skid marks to try to figure out, you know, how fast were these cars going, that's the speed, and in which direction were they traveling at the time of impact. Was one westbound and one northbound, for example, okay? So that's velocity. Now let's talk about acceleration. Okay, so that's that's the second vocabulary word. The next vocabulary word is acceleration. Um, unfortunately, most people hear this word, you know, at a time when they've already driven cars. They know how to drive a car. They have their driver's license. Okay. The accelerator is the gas, right? So when you press on the gas, that's the accelerator. Now, if you wanna maintain a certain speed on the roadway, you, you always have your foot on the gas a little bit to maintain that speed, okay? And don't confuse this physical science term acceleration with the accelerator on your, you know, your car, okay? Acceleration is the change in velocity over time or the change in speed over time. We talked about that car 
going a constant 55 miles per hour. After one hour, it went 55 miles. After another hour, it went 55 miles. After another hour, it went 55 miles. But what happens if somebody is speeding up? We have two things. Speeding up is called acceleration. Slowing down. acceleration in driver's ed you call that the gas pedal and you call this one the brake okay in physics we call it acceleration if you're going faster and faster and faster and faster and deceleration if you're getting slower and slower and you come to a stop okay so if we have our car once again we're traveling in this direction Let's pretend like we're at a stop light and the light turns green and it's our turn to go. And so you press on the gas, right? So at time zero, your speed is zero. And let's say after uh, 10 seconds, your speed is five miles per hour because you're starting to go. After 20 seconds, your speed is now 10 miles per hour. After 25 seconds, let's say your speed is 15 miles per hour. Okay, um, the graph could go on and this is, this is um, <laughs> you know, a very slow acceleration. We're normally like zooming down the street after 10 seconds, we're up to like, you know, the speed limit or something. But let's just for the sake of discourse here describe this so you can see how the speed is constantly changing okay we're starting out with zero and then after a while you're five and then after a while you're 10 and then after a while you're 15. so we call that the speeding up and the acceleration is the change in speed divided by the change in time okay we have hours and we have seconds we have two times okay the change in speed is the difference between these. Okay, let me switch to a uh, different color pen here. So the change in speed is five miles per hour, okay, faster. And then that happened over 10, 10 seconds. Okay. We do that by 20 minus 10. Okay, so 20 minus 10 is 10 seconds. 10 minus 5 is 5 miles per hour. So the acceleration is described as 5 miles per hour every 10 seconds. Okay, so this is the change in speed divided by time. Okay, so we've got 10 miles per hour minus 5 miles per hour, which is Five miles per hour is our change in speed, and that change in speed is happening over every 10 seconds. Okay. We could also take this interval, okay? Here we have 15 minus 10, so that's still a difference at five miles per hour. And we could do 20 minus, uh, oh, I messed up my graph. Uh, we'll, we'll change this to a 30, let's fix this. So 30 minus 20 is 10. So over 10 seconds, you're going faster by five miles per hour. So, you know, you could do the math there and whatever, you get some numbers. But this right here is the acceleration, okay? It's the change in speed divided by whatever change in time you are doing, okay? So that's acceleration. All right. Now, let me talk to you about forces. Gravity is a force, and all forces affect motion, okay? You have to impart a force on an object to cause it to uh, begin moving, or to speed up or slow down or something like that, okay? Now, there are fundamental forces in uh, physics, okay? 
And uh, some of these ideas come back to uh, Aristotle, who uh, was a Greek philosopher who promoted the first ideas about what causes motion, okay? And this was in the fourth century BC, okay? And um, unfortunately, he got it all wrong, but he had some ideas about it. And he thought that an object is going to fall at a constant speed depending on its weight, okay? Depending on its weight. So he thought if you had uh, a heavy object, okay, like a hammer, and then a light object like a feather, the hammer would fall faster and the feather would fall slower, okay? Now, we know this is true from our everyday experience. We may not have dropped a hammer and a feather at the same time, but we can imagine in our minds that the hammer is gonna drop like a lead balloon, right? And the feather is just going to, you know, kind of feather, feather, float, and get to the ground, okay? Uh, in the moon landings, what the astronauts did was they took a, a hammer and a feather and they dropped the two. And because there is no air resistance on the moon, there's no atmosphere on the moon, these two objects hit the ground at the same time, okay? A long, prom uh, a long time promoted uh, story is that Galileo went to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which, Pisa, which is in uh, Italy, and dropped two uh, heavy iron weights, okay? One was like 10 pounds, one was like five pounds or three pounds, okay? And these are metal objects that don't experience much difference in air resistance, okay? And he dropped these two from the tower, and his assistant down at the bottom tried to measure, you know, which of the lead balls had hit the ground first. Was it the heavier ball that went faster, or was it the lighter ball that went faster, or did the two hit the ground at the same time? And what he found was that the two hit the ground at the same time, okay? So Aristotle was uh, incorrect about that. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping into gravity here with balls falling to the ground. But uh, it took 2,000 years before people began to correct his um, misstatements, okay? Now, there are fundamental forces in nature. There are four, okay? We, we, don't, we don't need to memorize them, but um, a force is a push or a pull. So if you want to push a block across the floor, you need to push on it, okay? So it, it moves from point A to point B, okay? And another way that you could move this block across the floor is to attach, attach a rope around it, okay? And pull it towards you, okay? So those are the two different kinds of uh, forces that we're uh, going to be uh, discussing. Now, it is possible for you to have a cancellation of force, okay? So, if one person pushes this way and another pushes this way with the same exact force, that object is going to have no motion. So, it is incorrect to say whenever you put a force on an object, it is going to move. That is not true. That is not true. It's possible for one person to put a force push on this block or put a force this way. Notice how the arrows indicate direction here of the uh, direction and magnitude. So if they're pushing in opposite directions with exactly the same force, there is no net force. The net force is the sum of the individual forces. If the forces cancel out, and how do they cancel out? Because they're equal and opposite. We say there is no net force. So that's the first kind of ideas 
you have pushing and you have pulling forces, you have net forces, sometimes if they can cancel out. Okay, so if they all cancel out, you have no net force. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned, there are four fundamental forces that cannot be explained in terms of any other force. Okay, I'm gonna list them out here on the board. There are four of them. Four fundamental forces. So you've got uh, gravity. We will talk more about gravity in the next lecture. You have the electromagnetic force. We have already talked about that. That's electricity. That's a proton in the nucleus and an electron in an atom being attracted to one another. So that's the electromagnetic force. You have the, uh, what's it called? The uh, weak force. And then you have the uh, strong nuclear force. We have talked about the nuclear force. Uh, we talked about the neutrons. They, when they are very close to protons, there's a very strong attraction somehow, and we call that the nuclear force. We haven't talked about the weak force. Okay, so we will talk about this in the next uh, lecture, okay? Those are the four fundamental forces. It's amazing. You know, there's many t different types of forces. Two cars crashing. Well, you know, how, how do we explain? Well, maybe the electromagnetic force would explain why two cars crash, because there are electrons in atoms that make up the bumper of one car, and there are electrons in the atoms of another bumper that make up the other car. And when these two cars crash, we with our eyes can see, oh, the, bump the bumpers crumple up. But what's causing that magical force? Well, it's electrons in one car and electrons in another car, you know, repelling each other. And that force is very strong and it accumulates in the bumpers be being disformed and stuff. Okay, so it's not strange for us to think about these things. Uh, gravity, for example, if I drop this pencil, it's gonna fall to the ground towards the planet Earth. So that's gravity. So we see these things, but explaining them uh, is very complicated and gravity is still a great mystery. We can say how it works. We can show the math for how it works, but we don't know why or really what is it, okay? So keep that in mind, we'll just kind of go through those, okay? Now, the, uh, Galileo, a uh, famous scientist, uh, kind of like Einstein, you know, people who lived back then knew, hey, do you know about Galileo? Yeah, we know him. Just like in today's society, we know who Einstein is, okay? He was a very smart scientist, well-known, and he contributed a lot to uh, the sciences, okay? And um, he, uh, in 1638, so that's more than like 400 years ago almost, he published his book about um, motion. Okay, so he studied this stuff, Galileo, okay? And he argued against Aristotle. He said, okay, look, heavier objects don't move faster than lighter objects if you drop them. But the question still remained, why does a rolling ball come to a stop, all right? So when you roll a ball, it should just keep rolling, but somehow something's causing it to stop. Why is that? So he, he analyzed these things and he thought more about uh, these things, okay? And he came up with ideas and laws of motion. I guess they call them Newton's law of motion, but Galileo also started formulating these things way back when, okay? Now you have resistance, okay? If I throw a ping pong ball out of an airplane, it's gonna speed up and then it's just gonna fall with a constant speed, okay? 
if I drop a piece of paper, it doesn't fall as fast as a rock. It just kind of flutters to the ground because there's air in the way that it has to push out of the way in order to fall to the ground, or the ping pong ball has to push air out of the way to uh, get to the ground, okay? So air resistance, basically air that slows down objects. And that's related to the surface area or the size of an object, okay? So if I have a piece of paper and I try to throw this across the room, it's not going to go very far because there's a whole bunch of air in the way that's going to hit that large surface of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and slow it down and make it fall to the ground. But if I crumple that uh, piece of paper up into a little ball, okay, I can maybe throw that uh, towards the trash can and try to make a, make a two pointer or three pointer from this distance. Okay, so this is gonna go through the air much, much better because it has a smaller surface area that's, that's exposed to the air versus a large flat piece of paper. Does that make sense? So if something has a large surface, okay, it's gonna have a higher air resistance. Something with a smaller surface area it's gonna have a lower air resistance. Okay. Things with a lower surface area that are meant to travel very far distances are things like arrows, maybe a dart, a bullet, things like that, okay? All of their material is kind of behind them and it exposes just a very small tip towards the uh, front in the direction it's moving, okay? So if a dart goes this direction, it has little air resistance. If a dart goes this direction sideways, you know, there's much more surface. So it's gonna hit a lot more of the molecules that make up the air and slow it down, okay? Now there's also surface friction or resistance as you move things across a surface, okay? And we call that friction. You can have uh, friction with the air. Uh, we talked about astronomy in NAS 101, where if you have a, an asteroid entering the Earth's atmosphere, there's a lot of air resistance, so much so that it heats up the, ap the asteroid and it, it can explode or fragment or basically burn up in the Earth's atmosphere because it gets so hot. It's moving so quickly, it hits air molecules and that creates friction or air resistance and it heats up the asteroid until it just vaporizes, and so it never hits the ground. It explodes in the air or it just vaporizes, and that's what shooting stars basically are. Small grains of dust uh, that, that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Friction is a surface effect, so if you take a block big heavy couch or something or a refrigerator and you try to uh, push that across a carpet that's very hard to do okay because the carpet is a, a rough surface so you yourself I'll, I'll use little uh, blue arrows here this is you pushing on this uh, on this uh, refrigerator, trying to push it across the floor, and you're putting a tremendous amount of force on it, okay, to try to push this refrigerator, which weighs a lot, okay, across a carpet. But what's happening here is that the friction, the surface of the carpet, because it's rough, resists your motion by counteracting that force. So I'll try to use a color that shows up well. Uh, white, I think, shows up well. And so this is a counteracting force, okay? So it's almost like the carpet is pushing back on you, and that is the correct way to think about this physical phenomenon, okay? You, with the blue arrow, have a tremendous force that's pushing in one direction, and the carpet 
for whatever reason, right, uh, is rough and it's almost like it's pushing back on the refrigerator. And I've indicated that arrow smaller, which means that that force is not as much as you. You win because your arrow is bigger than that. So your net force is moving to the right. So you're able to push this refrigerator with great effort across the carpet in the direction shown by the blue arrow. Now don't worry, we're not gonna plug numbers in here. We're gonna use graphical analysis of these vectors. Now the way you do this is you uh, position the blue arrow, I, I tried to make it the same length, right underneath uh, the white arrow, okay, the white arrow. So that's about this much. And uh, you do a subtraction, okay? You look at what's left over. I'll, I'll show that in yellow here with some dotted lines, okay? You don't, you don't have to put the dots, but I'm just doing that so you can kind of see, okay? So we have a force this way, and then we have a force this way, and the net force is shown there in uh, yellow. And the cool thing about vectors, remember vectors are like an arrow that re represent direction and magnitude of something. And so the great thing about vector addition is you can just do what's called a head to tail um, kind of addition. You put the tail of this uh, white vector on the head of the blue vector. So it's a head to tail addition and you just add them up to see like, okay, how much is left over, okay? Now, if they were equal and opposite, uh, there would be no motion, the net force would be zero, but here the person is winning out, okay? So that's an example of, of, a, of a friction force, okay? A friction force opposes your direction of friction. So friction is always opposing your effort. If I try to move um, something across a room this way, it's always hard. If I try to move something across the same floor this way, it's always gonna be hard because you know there's something pushing against it, okay? Now, I think there might be enough room on this page to show the situation where if I have a refrigerator, And I have a smooth vinyl floor that might exist in your kitchen. You're putting uh, the same amount of force on it, maybe, as you're trying to move this, uh, you know, refrigerator across your kitchen for whatever reason. And the friction is less, okay, less friction. I'm trying to indicate that with a small little white arrow versus a very large white arrow, okay? So what I wanna emphasize here is that it's obviously easier to push a refrigerator across the kitchen floor because when you do your net forces, you really win out, okay? So if you take your arrow, which is counteracted by a friction force that's very small on a smooth vinyl floor, your uh, net force is gonna be quite large, okay? What I am trying to say here is that friction depends on the surface. A rough surface, like asphalt or carpet, is really gonna have a high friction, but a smooth surface, like uh, linoleum, vinyl, a waxed floor, a waxed bowling lane in the bowling alley, or ice, for example, is very smooth and slippery. These are gonna have low amounts of resistance or friction, okay?
Okay, so let's make a little note of that. Smooth surfaces. Have less or lower friction. Remember, friction is a type of resistance, okay? Surface resistance, okay? All right, so why does a ball come to a stop after it's rolling? for a certain time period, okay? We roll a ball and eventually it comes to a stop. Why is that? Well, it's because of surface resistance, okay? The surface, as the ball is traveling over it, is constantly pushing in the opposite direction of that movement until the ball reaches a stop, okay? So surface, Resistance which we are calling friction, all right, pushes backwards on the ball and we're going to draw a little arrow pointing you know, really it should be underneath because that's where it's touching the ground, right? So this is the, the backwards, you know, friction. It's a force that's being placed opposite the ball, okay? So if the ball is moving this way, the friction is that way. And we know that that's going to have a, a net force on the ball, right? And so it's gonna cause it eventually to come to a stop, okay? The ball gets slower, and slower and slower and it eventually deaccelerates until it comes to a rest. We use this term a lot in physics, resting state or rest. It just means the ball is not moving. It has a velocity of zero. Now, this brings up a very important point, and I want to give you a new vocabulary word, inertia. Inertia is defined as the tendency of an object to remain in an unchanging motion, whether actually moving at rest or not, okay? What does that mean? What the heck did I just say? If an object is at rest, it, stand, it tends to stay at rest, unless you push it, move it, kick it, bump it, something, okay? And an object that is moving tends to remain moving. This is where I'm going to just uh, mix in part of my lecture with this definition, unless there is a force put on that object. So a refrigerator in our kitchen is expected to be at rest, sit there, don't move around, okay? Unless we put a force on it, like we start pulling it out from the wall, okay? A ball 
for example, a bowling ball that we roll down the bowling alley is expected to keep moving and moving and moving until something puts a force on it like the bowling pins. It hits a wall or the, it bounces into the gutter or something, okay? So we know that an object's gonna stay at rest if it's at rest or it's gonna keep moving if it's moving unless there's a force placed on it, okay? And this is why things in outer space, there's no air resistance. Uh, they just keep moving and moving and moving and moving, okay? There's nothing ever to slow it down, okay? So things, you know, have been moving in outer space for just uh, centuries, right? Without any uh, effect, okay? So a ball rolling across the floor slows to a stop because there's a force that um, is, is imparted on it, okay? A satellite is just going to keep moving and moving and moving because there's no force on it. So it's going to move just forever without anything ever slowing it down, if there's nothing ever slowing it down. Okay. Now, that's it for uh, motion. So we've talked about motion, distance, time, speed, velocity, acceleration, resistance. We have air resistance and surface resistance. Surface resistance is specifically called friction, and we've talked about inertia. That's it for motion, and we will get into gravity, which is a special type of motion uh, and acceleration in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. Please like and give a thumbs up. Please do consider subscribing to let others know this YouTube channel is somewhat useful for you. Have a great day.